Good evening. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the Bader Contemporary American Authors Lecture. At this evening's event, we are honored to present the award-winning author, Roxane Gay. I am Rachel Allen, the Chief Operating Officer of the Mary Grove Conservancy. The Conservancy sponsors the legacy programs of Mary Grove College, the Institute for Detroit Studies, the Institute for Arts Infused Education, and of course, the Contemporary American Authors Lecture Series, which has been inviting noteworthy African-American writers to the campus since 1989. We thank the Lillian and Don Bowder Endowment, the Kresge Foundation, the Hudson Weber Foundation, the Herb Family Foundation, the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, and the Michigan Humanities Council, as well as the many Detroit community members and Mary Grove alumni, faculty, staff, and administrators whose financial support and volunteer efforts keep our events free and open to the public. We are deeply grateful to our community partners for this event, the Immaculate Heart of Mary Sisters, Detroit Public Television, the Tuxedo Project, and Source Booksellers. As a proud Mary Grove College alumna, I am proud to welcome you to this event, and I look forward to seeing you on our beautiful campus once the pandemic is over. Now, I am pleased to introduce our MC for this evening's program, the host of DPTV's American Black Journal and WDETFM's Detroit Today, and the founder of Tuxedo Project, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Stephen Henderson. Thanks a lot, Rachel. Uh, it is really great to be here for uh, yet another year of CALS. Uh, I think I speak for just about everybody when I say that uh, I, I think we all hoped that uh, this year's CALS event could be in person uh, at Mary Grove and that we would have Roxanne Gay here in Detroit with us uh, in, the, in the big auditorium there. Uh, of course, uh, COVID continues to confound uh, our plans to get back to normal, but uh, this is, this is going to be great. Anyway, uh, these virtual events, uh, I think, get us as close as we can get to, uh, to the normalcy that we're looking forward to and uh, expecting. Uh, I, I'm really excited uh, to be able to introduce uh, Roxanne Gay, uh, who I just think is one of the most important voices uh, in a number of different conversations that we're having in this country uh, right now. Uh, Roxanne, of course, is the author of uh, an essay collection called Bad Feminist, a short story collection, a novel, and another short story collection, but I think she's best known, at least as a writer, for her memoir, Hunger. Uh, I, I'm gonna get to uh, Roxanne really quickly, but before I do, I, I just wanna say that uh, one of the things that I am really moved by uh, in Roxanne's work uh, is the the way in which whatever she's writing about, whatever the subject is, uh, she writes about it from the standpoint of uh, a universal humanity. Uh, uh, this is somebody who's writing about weight issues from the, the, the standpoint of just being a person. Uh, she's writing about race and gender. Uh, from those same standpoints. And that's a very, I think, difficult feat to accomplish uh, as a writer, to always be able to relate to lots of other people, uh, whether they share your experience or not. Uh, she really has perfected uh, that approach to writing uh, and to storytelling. And so uh, I'm really excited that she's here with us. She is here virtually, uh, not, not here in Detroit. Uh, but I'm sure uh, you will all be really, uh, really enthralled by what she has to say. So, Roxanne, welcome to Detroit. Welcome back to Detroit virtually, yes. and uh, and take it away. Thank you. It's so good to see you again. And um, I wish that we were able to share the same physical space. As we all know, these virtual events are a, gr a good substitute, but nothing can compare to being able to share the same physical space. But hopefully in the coming months, all of this will change and we'll be able to see one another once more. Until then, I thought I would read a few newer essays that I've been working on and uh, then have a conversation with you uh, by doing some Q&A because I always love interacting with an audience. And so we have been working at home now for more than a year. 
And I've had a lot of time to think about what it means to work from home. And so this is a piece called How to Work from Home During a Pandemic. One, remember that you have a home office, even though it has become, as of late, a storage unit for galleys, technology accessories, contributor copies of work you appear in, puzzles, audio equipment, and anything else you can't or don't want to find a place for. Two, buy a new computer even though you do not need a new computer. Why? Because you're working from home now, and you do your when you want to do your best work, you need the best tools. Three, spend several days setting up the new computer on the desk you must clean in order to actually use it as a desk. Organize your computer files diligently. Make sure everything is backing up to Dropbox and that all of your Dropbox folders are also neatly organized. Four, bake a lot. Tell yourself you can get small, manageable tasks done while doughs are rising and things are baking or chilling or setting. Somehow manage to not accomplish many small, manageable tasks. Five, read the news obsessively because it is important to stay informed because there is just so much news and responsible adults stay well informed because knowing what's happening beyond the four walls of your home that you rarely leave offers a semblance of control over the unpredictable and uncontrollable. Six, Develop a system for responding to emails and a series of form letters for common queries you receive. Forget what that system is. Develop a system for responding to emails and a series of form letters for common queries you receive. Forget what that system is. Develop a system, oh, just give up. Watch marathons of Law and Order SVU and Chicago PD. Keep track of how many times you see a given episode. Buy two large whiteboards and hang them on an office wall. Write down every project you're working on and everything you need to accomplish for each of those projects along with deadlines. Nine, despair. 10, come up with three exciting new projects even though you have a dozen unfinished projects awaiting your attention. Work diligently on these new projects. 11, Get into shorts because you work from home now and no one can see you and it doesn't matter what you wear. Marvel at the roominess of basketball shorts and the utility of cargo shorts. Divide your wardrobe into hard clothes to be avoided at all costs and soft clothes to be worn at all times. 12. Look forward to visits from the mail carrier or delivery services. Treat checking the mail as a real event. Feel profound sadness when there is no new mail. 12 or 13 rather, complete one very small, simple task, feel Herculean, take the next three days off as a reward. 14, enjoy weeks and weeks with an empty calendar after years of an overwhelming calendar and then feel the existential dread once more as the world begins adapting to everyone living in isolation and your calendar starts filling up again. 15, Discover the Zoom video conference feature where you can enhance your appearance. Select this feature as a default setting. 16. Learn how to stare into the camera and not the Zoom window. Learn how to look like you're paying attention while doing other things during Zoom meetings. 17. Judge people's backgrounds in the tiny Zoom windows during meetings. Don't bother to organize or neaten the cluttered background of your own tiny Zoom window, but bristle when people comment on your clutter. Explain that it is mostly books as if that is somehow absolution. 18. Practice closing out of Zoom sessions quickly to avoid that awkward pause after everyone has said goodbye and you have to click on leave session. 19. Get a ring light to improve your lighting on video calls. Rude that you have started caring about lighting. Keep a nice top in your office to throw on whenever you feel like you need to step up your game. 20. Participate in a couple documentaries. Watch the camera crew set up and put the producers on a laptop that you can see as they stand six feet away from you with bandanas over their faces like bandits holding a boom microphone over your head. Marvel at how quickly nearly everything has adapted. 21. Mourn the loss of Black lives at the hands of law enforcement over and over and over again. Follow the worldwide protests against police brutality. Write furiously about how desperately change is needed. 
attend via Zoom a meeting with your city's police commission and realize just how much of a fight lies ahead. 22, realize what you have always suspected, that your work is profoundly inessential and have a crisis of faith about what you should do with your life. 23, read countless articles about improving your productivity while working from home. Do absolutely nothing to change your work habits. 24, complete another small irrelevant task. Reward yourself generously. 25, leave your house to run an errand. Wonder if you've entered a dystopian nightmare as you liberally apply hand sanitizer to your gloved hands. Decide that leaving the house is overrated. Return home quickly. 26. Write in furtive spurts, a few hundred words here, a few hundred words there. Lament that each new piece of writing is the worst thing you have ever written until you write something new that is somehow even worse than your worst. 27. Hang a bird feeder in the backyard and spend hours watching the birds swoop in for a snack. Realize that your backyard has become the hippest avion spot in town. 28. Listen to your partner working in her office upstairs. Note how diligent and responsible she is, her impeccable work ethic. Vow to be more like her, maybe tomorrow or the day after that. 29. Record a few episodes of your podcast. Hope the world hasn't changed too much by the time the episodes air. And then, of course, find that the world has changed too much. 30. Inventory your office supplies and organize them. Give up after 15 minutes. Research professional organizers. Research vacations. Research Joni Mitchell. Research James Taylor. Research the history of recipes. Research the history of celebrity gloss gossip. Fall down rabbit hole after rabbit hole. Hours later, try to remember where you started and what you were looking for. 31. Delete all emails where your name is spelled wrong. 32. Download language learning software. Take up puzzles. Buy a guitar and virtual gar guitar lessons. Learn how to fly a drone. Vow to improve yourself and expand your hobbies and interests soon. And finally, write an essay on how to work from home during a pandemic. I am sure by now all of us have come up with several different kinds of uh, coping strategies for working from home, and some of them work better than other. Uh, I have found that I am not very productive when I work from home, but I don't know that I'm productive anywhere else either. But one of the things I've been thinking about, especially over the past couple years, is the kinds of things to which we build monuments and why, especially as we continue to have conversations over which monuments should stay and which monuments should perhaps be torn down. And so I wrote an essay thinking through some of these issues and it's called How to Build a Monument. The Great Pyramid of Giza is as miraculous and majestic as you might imagine, if not more. It was built with 2.3 million blocks of limestone and granite reaching far into the sky, a monument to the pharaoh Khufu. I saw other pyramids in and around Cairo that were equally awe-inspiring, constructed in seemingly perfect proportions, still standing after millennia despite desert winds and the blazing sun and millions of visitors eager to see a wonder of the world. In Luxor, we visited the Valley of the Kings and descended several stories below ground to see tombs that are still preserved, the walls adorned with elaborate hieroglyphics, resting places for Tutankhamun, Ramses II, Ramses III, Amenhotep. The Temple of Hatshepsut stood at the very top of a long staircase, its columns proudly erect, because Egyptian pharaohs built such monuments to honor the deities, to honor themselves, to honor their reigns. An avenue of sphinxes once connected the Temple of Luxor and the massive complex of the Temple of Karnak, and some of those sphinxes still remain, standing guard for what those monuments represent. In Agra, India, the Taj Mahal serves as a monument to love, built to honor a beloved wife. In Rome, the Colosseum is a monument to human brutality, gladiators fighting to the death for the merriment of the masses at the will of bloodthirsty rulers. The Arc de Triomphe in Paris looms over the Place d'Etoile, a monument to French armies and the French Empire. A gift from the French, the Statue of Liberty, is a symbol of what we were once or what is a symbol of what were once open American borders, the promise that immigrants would find safe harbor. 
Two acres in Washington, D.C. are dedicated to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Nearly 60,000 names are etched into long slabs of black granite. The Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe in Berlin stands where the Berlin Wall once divided West and East Germany. The memorial is marked by 2,711 concrete slabs, the scope of it an overwhelming reminder of human atrocity. The first memorial to the victims of lynching opened in 2018 in Birmingham, Alabama. The National Memorial for Peace and Justice features 800 steel columns, each bearing the names of counties where black people were lynched and the names of the black lives lost to an abhorrent practice. In the museum, visitors learn in detail about the extent of lynching, how an entire people were terrorized by the threat of a noose and limb. The Cape Coast Castle in Ghana in Ghana still stands, allowing visitors to walk through the dungeons where Africans were held before making the transatlantic crossing. There are spaces to leave memorial wreaths and tributes to the people once held in such a terrible place. At the United Nations headquarters in New York, the Ark of the Return, triangles of marble featuring a map of the slave trade, a person carved from black granite from Zimbabwe, a reflecting pool, serve as a memorial to the victims of the transatlantic slave trade. Rumors of War is a statue created by the artist, by the artist Kahinde Wiley. It is a towering work of art in all senses. A young black man with dreadlocks, wearing a hoodie and Nike sneakers, sits astride a muscular stallion. He looks strong and proud, unapologetic in his blackness, or at least that's what I see. Before this statue was moved to its final home in Richmond, Virginia, it stood in Times Square, a spectacle in the center of a spectacle. My wife and I went to look at the statue to appreciate the scale of it, to see how a black artist challenged how we think of monuments what deserves to be remembered in memorial. Every culture throughout history has dedicated an unfathomable amount of resources to the preservation of lives lived and lost, monarchic reigns, elected leaders, wars, and the men and women who fought in them, the deities they worshiped. It is only in recent years that we have begun to memorialize atrocities and the lives sacrificed to hatred and oppression. It is only in recent years that we have acknowledged the importance of reminders of our failings as much as we remember our successes. There are more than 1,700 monuments and other public symbols of the Confederacy still standing in the United States. They memorialize America's original sin, a war lost, lives sacrificed to white supremacy, and the shame of a society more invested in human capital than freedom and dignity. For decades, the fact of these monuments went largely unquestioned or questions about their place in our society were ignored. These monuments, according to their defenders, preserve history, but that preservation comes at a cost and they are a constant reminder that some people value a history that was for their forefathers quite different from the history of the people they enslaved and fought to keep enslaved. The word monument finds its origins in Latin and French, deriving from the word monere, to remind. But all too often, people revere monuments not because they want a reminder to avoid repeating historical wrongs, but because they want to preserve toxic ideologies, because they want what they know of the world to remain unchallenged. In Richmond, Virginia, Monument Avenue is lined with monuments to Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, and others. A statue of Jefferson Davis once also stood on the avenue, but it was torn down during a protest following the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Behind the statues of Monument Avenue, there are mansions, some more than 100 years old, monuments to wealth and whiteness, because when the neighborhood was created, only white people were allowed to live there, and this segregation was, for many years, codified by city ordinances. It is supposed to be a different time, but it isn't. State and city officials and local residents continue to fight over the disposition of the remaining monuments and over what should or should not be remembered. 
all across the United States and around the world, monuments to the Confederacy and to slavery are being torn down by people who have had enough of racial oppression, systemic racism, and the monuments that valorize these conditions. In tearing down these monuments, activists are declaring that some things do not deserve to be remembered and that some memories are actively detrimental to our well being and cultural memory. Just as many people are decrying the removal of these monuments, prioritizing their attachment to the past over the lived, over the lived realities of people in the present. In June 2020, then President Donald Trump signed the executive order protecting American monuments, memorials, and statues to prosecute anyone who destroys, damages, vandalizes, or desecrates a monument, memorial, or statue within the United States. The order is also punitive and will deny funding to municipalities that don't protect monuments, no matter how odious the practices or people they celebrate. Efforts to preserve monuments to racism and oppression are, hopefully, a last gasp of Confederate malignance, a last attempt to hold on to the way the world once was, where people thrived not on merit, but by the mere virtue of white skin. Because in a world where everyone is equal, their success would be unlikely. In the scars left behind by these monuments, we have the opportunity to build something new. That's what this monument, that's what this moment requires not merely change, but a completely new way of thinking. We must find, we must finally dis dismantle white supremacy and create something better, something equitable in its place. But where do we begin? What do we do as individuals? There are no easy answers. Racism has persisted across centuries. We will not suddenly vanquish it simply because more people are finally aware that systemic racism is real and malignant and affects every aspect of our lives. And though we do need to reimagine our understanding of race and equity, the work white people must do now is not nearly as impossible as it might seem. And it is certainly not as impossible as living under systems of oppression that limit every opportunity have long been. Yes, you can read all of the books about race and racism that are suddenly in fashion. You can donate money to nonprofits dedicated to community bail or combating racism or protecting civil rights. You can and should attend protests and bear witness to how aggressively, militaristically and violently police departments across this country are dedicated to protecting the status quo. You can volunteer your time and expertise to organizations working to enfranchise voters and abolish police and prisons and the like. You can support political candidates at the local, state, and federal levels and canvass and vote in every election. But really, these are table stakes, the kind of community-oriented work we should all be doing because we share this world with a great many others. This is a moment that demands the repudiation of silence in the face of oppression. All too often, people remain silent. They are aware racism persists, that police brutality is rampant, that voters across the United States are disenfranchised, but they decide there's nothing they can do about it, so feeling bad is enough. Such laments are not nearly enough. One of the most important things people can do is not remain silent about racism. It is important to actively and consistently acknowledge racism and its effects, call it out when you witness it, and use your privilege to demand equity whenever and wherever you can. You have to be willing to hold yourselves, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, your community, and your family accountable for the prejudices that they hold. You have to abandon the notion of allyship, abandon the comfortable distance provided by allyship, and decide you are only as free as the most marginalized members of your community. Now is the time to do that work of being actively anti-racist, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it demands more of you than you are willing to give. It will require sacrifice and the seeding of position and power that was not earned on merit, but built on the back of white supremacy and black suffering. Now is the time of changing what you value and what you believe deserves remembrance. We do not need monuments to preserve the history of the Confederacy and those who benefited from that treason. Books do that work, and well. To build a monument is a time and labor-intensive process. 
Someone decide, decides a person or an era or event needs to be memorialized. They design an obelisk or a structure or a statue. In the case of a statue, a model is made and then a framework and then a mold and then a cast. And then that cast is filled with bronze, melted at 2000 degrees. And then the cast is removed and the bronze is cleaned and a patina, a patina is applied and the statue is displayed in whatever way its designer deems fitting. It's all very intricate, which defies credulity when considering the horrors to which this intricacy has been applied. But that can change. We can change what we value and what deserves to be remembered. We can learn to build new monuments that create a cultural memory that acknowledges the sins of the past, the realities of the present, and the possibilities of the future, if only we stand ready. So thank you so much. Um, I think about monuments a lot because we see them everywhere and we see what people value. And I always wonder when we will start to have monuments that more accurately reflect the world that we live in and the wide range of people who have contributed to that world. But once in a while, I'm not actually thinking of anything serious. And I think about nemeses. I talk about having a nemesis quite a lot on Twitter. I actually have 10. And I think that people have gotten really interested in this idea of having a nemesis. And there are some different kinds of rules that I have in the ways I hold myself accountable. But I've been thinking quite a lot about how we engage in online spaces and competition. And so I wrote an essay called The Pleasure of Clapping Back. And I'm not gonna read the entirety of this essay, but I'm going to read part of it. Nemesis was the ancient Greek goddess of retribution. She punished evil deeds, undeserved good fortune, and hubris. Disgusted by his arrogance, Nemesis brought Narcissus to his unfortunate end, punishing him for his vanity by luring him to the water where he fell in love with his own reflection and died because he simply could not look away. The story of Nemesis is compelling because she was inescapable. Her brand of justice was uncompromising. I, however, am not the goddess of retribution. I'm just a writer and a woman. I am too sensitive. I have thin skin. I love having the last word. I am a control freak. I cannot let things go. I take criticism personally. And being on social media offers ample opportunity for me to reveal the worst of myself. The nature of being a writer is that I must contend with criticism. When it's constructive, I do eventually try to absorb the criticism and improve my craft. When the criticism is less than constructive, I get defensive. I feel attacked. I start to doubt everything I have ever written and everything I will ever write in the future. Social media has done a great many things for writers. It has allowed us to interact with readers and fans, but it has also exposed us to people with bad intentions, people who take issue with what we write, how we write, or who we are. And there is something about these people who want to tell you they hate you or that you are mediocre or terrible that cuts really deep. You can read a hundred compliments, but what stays with you is that one person confirming your worst fears about yourself. And unfortunately, I harbor a great many fears about myself. I have 10 nemeses, people who have slighted me in ways both real and imagined who are now mortal adversaries I must defeat. They are nemeses because a loved one has a crush on them and goes on and on about it uh, just to get under my skin or because they have a career trajectory I envy or they are vigorously mediocre or they have wronged someone I care about or they have wronged me. One of my nemeses is CrossFit and that feels fairly self-explanatory. Another nemesis is Rachel Maddow, because my wife loves to watch the Rachel Maddow show, and I don't believe in cable news, and she thinks Maddow is cute. And at night, I sit in bed, arms crossed over my chest, as she pays keen attention to Maddow's endless deconstruction of whatever is going on in the news that day. There is also my primary nemesis, the woman I direct most of my nemesis-related energy toward. I cannot disclose the provenance of my disdain for her, but she smiles too much. She is thriving professionally, and I think that she exists despite me. 
There are many famous nemeses, both real and imagined. Batman and the Joker, Superman and Lex Luthor, Professor X and Magneto, Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton, even Villanelle. The most important thing to remember is that the rivalry must be tended to. It is an eternal flame, the heat of which can warm you during dark times. An enemy is a nuisance, but a nemesis is someone for whom you harbor an abiding, relentless dislike. A nemesis must be a worthy ad adversary. It is far too easy for someone completely odious to be a nemesis. People often ask if, for example, the president is my nemesis, but that would be absolutely beneath me. Envy is certainly part of having a nemesis, but it's not quite jealousy, because generally you and your nemesis are equals in some way, even if you are the only person who believes that to be true. A nemesis can give you purpose, can hone your ambition. What I'm saying is that a nemesis is motivational. I keep track of my nemeses with an app. I check in on them and their various social media platforms to further stoke my petty feelings toward them. These people largely have no idea I exist, and I would never, ever do anything to them, but it brings me pleasure to nurture this enmity. I often discuss my nemeses on Twitter, and I've been doing so since 2011. Back then, I was tweeting about my Scrabble nemesis, a man I beat during a Scrabble tournament who did not take the loss well. He stormed off, which is just poor sportsmanship, and in the wake of his fury, my first nemesis rose from the ashes of his defeat. At the following tournament, I began to tweet about our interactions and a vocation was born. In the ensuing years, I have peppered my online conversation with musings about one or more of my nemeses, mostly because it's a fun way to relax, but I'm also quite serious. On May 18th, 2018, I remarked that my nemesis is having a good year professionally and has clear skin. It's a lot to take. In November, I said, just checked in on my nemesis. She's still trash. Just so I could assure any interested parties that the fire of my dislike for my nemesis continued to burn brightly. Sometimes I put a harmless but effective curse on my nemesis, like I hope the sun is very bright and my nemesis can't find her sunglasses. I experience a frisson of excitement when I add a new nemesis to the rotation. I also believe that the nemesis of my friend is my enemy. So when my assistant shared with me that she had a nemesis, I felt a great deal of solidarity prompting me to tweet, my assistant has a nemesis. And now when I see her nemesis tweet, I narrow my eyes and feel a bit of anger. This remains true. Her nemesis does love to go on and on about inconsequential things, and sure, most of us do this, but when a nemesis does it, the behavior is somehow worse. Much to my surprise, many of my online followers have become invested in my nemesis chronicles. My agent has emailed me asking to reveal the identity of my primary nemesis. Interviewers ask if I will reveal their identities. Journalists have written entire articles about this absurd little pastime of mine. They have requested interviews I have mostly declined because it isn't that deep, but also it kind of is. One publication referred to me as the queen of nemesis Twitter, which was a lot like, let's just all calm down. The argument could certainly be made that there is nothing healthy or productive about having nemeses. People have told me it's silly, petty, and unnecessary, but a lot of hobbies could be termed as such. Oftentimes, when I discuss my nemeses online, people ask me why I'm dwelling on negativity, but it doesn't feel negative to have nemeses. It's quietly thrilling. It makes me feel a little bit, it makes my life feel a little bit bigger than it is. It makes me feel like I have a little more control than I do. And it's a form of release. No one is harmed by my tweeting petty, inconsiderate things about my anonymous nemeses. The nurturing of nemeses is not something that dominates any part of my life. I have met at least one of my nemeses, and I was perfectly pleasant during the encounter. Charming, even, and there's photographic evidence of this. As someone who has been on the internet since 1992, I do believe that what happens online is as real as things that happen in the physical world. The friendships I've developed with people I meet online are real. The amity we share is real. Though I have never really used any of the dating apps or websites, I have met several romantic partners via the internet. 
When I argue with someone online, I am actually frustrated or irritated or angry. Those feelings don't magically dissipate when I step away from the computer or look away from my phone, though they are put in the proper perspective when I do step away. Young writers ask me if they need to be on social media to have a successful career. And the answer is of course not, but that social media when used well can be greatly beneficial. There is of course a price to pay for that. The further you are from being a heterosexual, white, middle-class, able-bodied man, the higher the price you pay. You have to simply decide if you are willing to pay that price and moreover, if you are able to. When I first started using Twitter, I was in grad school in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. I was living in a town of about 4,000 people, and I was studying rhetoric and technical communication and teaching for the first time and adjusting to going from the middle of the country to the edge of nowhere. I wanted to feel connected to the world in some way, and I wanted to be able to communicate with other writers. I wanted to feel like I was a part of something without actually physically having to be a part of something. I could be shy and awkward, but no one would ever know because I had a facility with language and the distance or perhaps anonymity of the keyboard and screen. I could hide in plain sight, which is something I've been doing since I first started using the internet. Back in the early 90s, most of us who were online were pretending in some form or fashion. We were fabulists. This was before people freely exchanged pictures and the whole truth of themselves. We were just names and words. Most of the time, we were talking dirty to one another, pretending to be more attractive, more interesting, and more adventurous than we really were. I don't know that any of us knew what the internet would eventually become, how it would be such a fundamental part of a privileged life. And because we didn't know what it would become, we spent every day online like it might be our only day. We developed passionate connections with strangers from all around the world. We shared highly creative we shared highly curated versions of ourselves, but not in the Instagram way. Some people grew out of that way of being online and started being more honest, started being more authentic versions of themselves. The artifice fell away. We began using our real pictures, our real names. But some people never grew out of being that way. The internet was a virtual playground where they could be anyone they wanted, say anything they wanted without consequence. A lot of the tensions that arise from online interactions exist because people with different ethics around how to be online are forced to share this virtual space, even though we don't all play by the same rules. I understand that way of being online where you can say terrible things to strangers, racist, sexist, homophobic things that you wouldn't dare say to someone's face. I understand the rush these people must feel when they revel in cruelty and embracing the taboo and unacceptable. It makes me consider how I would behave if there were no consequences for my actions. I won't pretend I would be perfect, but I do know I would not be mindlessly cruel. I am too sensitive online and sometimes, even when people approach me innocuously, I overreact. I wanna attack before I'm attacked. And then I feel terrible about myself because that's not who I am, not really. Sometimes I apologize for my behavior and sometimes I don't. When I don't, I tell myself it's fine. I tell myself that given all of the harassment I tolerate, of course I'm defensive. And then a troll says something cruel and I feel justified in being too sensitive and overly prickly. It's a vicious cycle. Trolls are generally so banal. I engage with trolls the way a predator toys with its prey. They tell me things I already know or they unwittingly reveal what they hate most in themselves. A common entreaty of theirs is that I'm fat, which is not new information. I literally wrote a whole book about being fat. They tell me I'm ugly or I'm unhealthy or that I'm gonna die alone. They call me a snowflake or a libtard. They simply write hashtag MAGA. They spew ra racial epithets. They call me a dyke. They make fun of my last name, which is so hilariously immature and dull. Children have been making fun of my last name since around 1982. They search through my old tweets, some of which are certainly lousy takes, and offer them up as evidence of what I'm not entirely sure. They try to get me to debate them as if I'm simply on social media to sit around talking about the news of the day with random lonely men. I deserve a better class of interlocutor. It is all so absurd. I recognize this, but still, I cannot always resist engaging. And then followers will tell me not to feed the trolls or they will say bot. And that is even more grating because I have been online for nearly 30 years. I'm clear on who or what I am dealing with. 
I am clear on the why of it. I often like responding to trolls and the lesser of my critics, clapping back as the current parlance goes, to playing t-ball, that tempered version of youth baseball where children swing their bats at a ball nestled gently on a stand instead of having to try and hit a pitch. It doesn't require much aim or coordination, but it teaches children the fundamentals of baseball. The trolls, with all their absurd banality, are the ball, waiting for me. They are an easy target, low-hanging fruit, and I am the child with a very big bat and very good aim. The trolls often make it even easier because they cannot spell or use punctuation properly. They tend to be wrong and loudly so. I can simply point their weaknesses out or I can say something clever or I can say something mean, generally attacking their intelligence, masculinity, or dim prospects. I enjoy throwing in a phrase like your mom's Cheeto crusted basement or using some of my favorite vocabulary words in an especially cutting manner. If someone steps to me disrespectfully, I serve that disrespect right back. If they get out of pocket, I let them know. It's as cathartic as talking about my nemeses, but with more immediacy. I know how futile it is. It is. I know that these people who argue with me don't care how I respond. I know I'm probably giving them what they want, attention, and the confirmation that they have drawn blood. I know they aren't going to recognize how poorly they are behaving. They're not going to apologize. Nothing good comes from this. The truth is that sometimes it just feels good to be mean in this neatly contained way. It feels good to stand up for myself because that largely only happens in online spaces where I have the time and space to think clearly and say exactly what I want, when I want, and how. It feels necessary to highlight the intensity, constancy, and breadth of harassment that Black queer women deal with online. It feels good and righteous to feel supported and seen, to be applauded for giving as good as I get. So thank you so much. And now I'd love to answer questions that you guys might have. <laughs> so I'm, I'm still giggling. <laughs> 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 and, you know, I, I started by uh, introducing you by talking about how uh, no matter what you write about, uh, you, you, you take on this very universal human quality, I think, that, um, uh, that appeals to, to, to people who may not share lots of your experiences. And I think that essay is a perfect example. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, universality, right? We all have uh, nemeses. We all have people who uh, we're jealous of. Uh, we all have people that uh, that that drive us nuts. Uh, and I love how you describe kind of dealing with this. I want to remind our uh, uh, our audience that uh, they can ask questions of Roxanne now. Uh, just put them in the chat, and we'll get them uh, queued up. We've already got some. Uh, to, to, to get things going. But before we do that, I, I want to talk about how you write about something like that. So, so that's, uh, I mean, it's a pretty personal uh, essay, but it's, it's um, you know, it's an admission of sorts, right? It's an admission, it's an admission of frailty and uh, uh, a vulnerability. And, and I think as a writer, that's one of the most difficult things to do is to look inside and say, here's something about me that I'm maybe not the most uh, happy with, but uh, I'm gonna explore what that looks like and feels like and share that with, with my readers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I don't love vulnerability on the page, but I do think that sometimes to write about a given subject, honestly, you do have to make yourself vulnerable and, and admit not only your imperfections, but sometimes, you know, we do fail. We do make mistakes. We are um, lesser versions of ourselves. And I, I always want to be able to be open about that, um, not to excuse bad behavior, but to say that we are all fallible. Mm -hmm. And when you make yourself vulnerable like that, I think people tend to find more ways of connecting. And feeling disarmed in a way where they can start to examine themselves. And I mean, in this essay, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, a you know, a non-serious uh, way of, of exposing vulnerability, but I mean, the, the rest of your work really exposes uh, 
vulnerability in, in, in many other ways. And hunger, of course, um, exposes a lot of very personal and painful uh, vulnerability as a way of, of telling that story. Do you, do you feel like it's different to do it in that context where it is something very serious than it is uh, talking about trolls on Twitter? Um, I, no, I don't think they're that different because on the surface, trolls on Twitter are kind of haha, but beneath it, there is this really sort of sinister layer of bigotry. And it, we've seen how that bigotry has bled out into the general culture over the past four and a half years. I mean, it's always been there, but we've really had a lot of up close examples ending with, I think, I mean, it's still going on, but January 6th and the attempted insurrection in Washington, DC. And so, you know, when I'm being vulnerable about something more personal, um, you know, I think it's, it's quite similar and it, it's to bring about the same effect. Imagine walking in someone else's shoes because the best nonfiction that I gravitate toward is one where, someone has really exposed themselves. And I find that sort of inroad where I can then think about my own experience in relation to theirs. Yeah. Uh, we do have an audience question about this. Uh, do you think having a nemesis makes us better thinkers and writers? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, I mean, I think it can, you know, like the, the my real nemeses are, extraordinarily talented people and extraordinarily ambitious. And I think that competition is healthy if you have the necessary perspective on it. And so when I see my nemesis achieve something, it just makes me work harder and it makes me want to write even better than I already am. And, you know, people have certainly taken this and run with it in ways that I could never have imagined. Um, <laughs> And in ways that make me think that it is far, like for them, I think it's, they think it's far more sinister than it is. It's not sinister. And like I said, I would never do anything to anyone. But when like the universe sort of hears me, <laughs> that's always nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, uh, the, we have another question about that. Someone saying that uh, that essay made them laugh. Uh, they're wondering what makes you laugh. Um, I tend to laugh at, you know, it's hard to say because I, you know it when you see it. Mm -hmm. um, you know it when you see it. Uh, I like things that are just unexpected and clever. Um, I'm trying to think of examples of comedians that make me laugh because comedians are the best sort of go-to. Even though she's she's sometime no, no, I'm not gonna go there. <laughs> um, I'm laughing though. <laughs> I like clever humor. I like incredibly clever humor. And um I like dry humor, like deadpan humor also really makes me laugh. So for example, the television show Succession on HBO. I love it. I, and I think it's far funnier than people give it credit for. And it amuses the hell out of me just seeing this sort of like completely morally bankrupt family and their way they interact and live in the world. And you just keep wondering when they're going to get their due and their comeuppance. <laughs> right. Uh, we have a couple of questions that go back to second essay you, you mm -hmm you read about monuments. Uh, yes. uh, two people want to know uh, what kind of monuments you would like to see or whether you're suggesting that maybe we sh shouldn't have monuments at all. Maybe that's an inappropriate way of memorializing people or issues. You know, I, 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 I would never say that we shouldn't have monuments. I think that memory is incredibly important. But when we have monuments, which are celebrations to people who have committed genocide, to people who have been part of the colonial project, to people who 
owned other human beings. I think that there's a clear line. A lot of people like to use the slippery slope argument when talking about things like this, like what's next, um, mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln? Well, maybe, I mean, <laughs> I think that our vision is, hindsight vision is much clearer. And sometimes cultural mores change and the kinds of things that were acceptable 200 years ago are certainly not acceptable now. And so the things that we memorialize, I think are inevitably going to change. And so I think that there's, I think that memorials can be incredibly important. So I would never suggest that we do away with them. But I do think that we have to, be careful and be thoughtful. And yeah, we have to be thoughtful about who and what we tend to memorialize. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've always thought that one of the problems is the simplicity uh, that, that surrounds these, these, these monuments. I mean, they are, they are shrines uh, mm -hmm. opposed to expositions, right? Um, so you talk about someone like Thomas Jefferson or, uh, or George Washington or, or, or any of the founders, um, these were complex people who did lots of really awful things, but they also did lots of things that uh, were, were really worth thinking about and, and memorializing. And, and the problem, of course, is that there's no context for these things. It's, it's, uh, it's a lionization of, uh, of people as opposed to an examination of who they are. And, and you know, I, I think one of the things that changed in the last 20 or 30 years is is the way in which we kind of create these things. I mean, there are lots more monuments now that are about exposition. I mean, the, the, the lynching monument in, uh, in Alabama, I think is a really interesting example of that. Um, and maybe it's the word that we're using that's the problem. Maybe it's not that we should be creating monuments, uh, but something else that, that, that kind of suggests this is somebody worth remembering, but we're not saying that they were perfect. Yeah, and you know, the thing is like, if we wanna remember, for example, I mean, because what we've been talking about, especially in the past couple of years is um, memorials to the Confederacy. I think that if you wanna have things that remind us of the past so that we don't make those same mistakes, they can't be celebrations. Yeah. I think they have to be frank expressions of what these people, represent and what they stand for. Yeah. Um, uh, Madeline says, how do you balance your desire to be honest and authentic, saying what you truly feel and believe with your desire to avoid cruelty or to empathize with people who are different from you? Um, that's a good question. You know, I think it's a fine balance. Um, and, you know, here's the thing. I think that you can be honest and you can be authentic without being cruel. And there are a lot of people who say cruel things and say, I'm just being honest. And yeah, no, you're trying to valorize really bad behavior. And so for me, there is, sorry for that notification that I can't turn off. Um, <laughs> for me, there is a clear line. Like, I don't feel the need to be honest in ways that are cruel. but. Um, I do believe that I can be honest in ways that where I explore my faults and where I've made mistakes. Um, and so I just think it's a question of, of common sense and decency. And I try not to ever be cruel. And I, I'm fairly confident that in general, actually more, I'm, I'm a kind person. And I'm, I know that everyone in my life would say so. And I'm proud of that. And I think it's important, but I also think it's important. So for example, in terms of like online trolls, you know, these people are not, it's not just harmless online trolling. It's like what a lot of people don't realize is that these people like go after your real life. They, they go after your home address. They start to harass your partner. Like my wife gets psychotic emails from trolls um, calling her um, an N word lover and making fun of or saying cruel things about she's Jewish, about her Jewish identity, um, incredibly anti-Semitic things. It's, it's horrific. And so this idea that we shouldn't talk about it and should not expose these people for the extents that they're willing to go to, uh, I think uh, is, n I just don't agree. I think it's important to talk about because otherwise they sort of seem to think that they have 
a, a carte blanche to behave this way. Yeah, yeah, and and there's also the difficulty though of, I guess, uh, trying not to bring more attention to somebody than they could get for themselves, right? Uh, right. In a lot of cases, these are people who don't have big audiences, uh -huh. uh, but they're they're swiping at you because you do, uh, and they Correct. want they want that they want that shine, right? They want the the reflection of your audience on them. Yes, and I do recognize that, and so I try not, you know, I do try not to give an undue attention. But sometimes, you know, I'm human, and I cannot resist the bait. <laughs> <laughs> uh, someone is asking who you read and which new writers you would most recommend? Who do I read? I read all kinds of things. And uh, so new writers I would recommend, um, I would re recommend Dantiel W. Moniz, who mm -hmm. has a book out now called Milk, Blood, Heat. And uh, it's a short story collection. It's truly remarkable. Uh, Gabriela Garcia, who is a former student of mine. So yes, I'm gonna big up my student. Uh, and her novel is called Of Women in Salt. Mm -hmm. And it is a beautiful novel told in uh, stories across three generations of Cuban women. Mm -hmm. And it's really, I love it. I've been with her from day one of the project. And I mean, I worked with her from day one of the project and uh, it's just so exciting to see it out in the world. Um, He's not a new writer, but I've just been reading more of his poetry. His name is Kaveh Akbar, K-A-V-E-H-A-K-B-A-R. And he's a remarkable poet. He has, I think, his third book of poetry coming out in the next year. And uh, I'm really excited to get my hands on it. And um, right now for myself, I'm reading Liberty by Caitlin Greenidge. And it is a novel about... Um, the immediate post-Civil War era when a young girl and a young black girl in Brooklyn, her mom is a doctor and she ends up becoming a doctor as well. And it's her story. And she marries a Haitian man and goes to Haiti. And that's where that's the part I'm at right now where she's about to go to Haiti and it's a lovely, lovely novel. So I also recommend that. Yeah. Uh, well, I think we're all still waiting to see what kind of writing, what kind of long form writing comes out of the pandemic? Uh -huh. uh, because we're still in the middle of it and, uh, and it hasn't been long enough. But uh, I, I wonder if you've seen things already that um, that jump out at you as, as significant writings uh, that come out of the pandemic. Um, not yet. It's too soon. Yeah. Have there been writings that have come out of the pandemic? Absolutely, but I firmly believe it's too soon. We are still in it. We have not had time to process this. I mean, and I do think it's a collective trauma. I, I, I think some people have been more traumatized than others because some people have lost loved ones. Some people got COVID, yeah. um, had to say goodbye to loved ones on FaceTime. And, you know, like a lot of us went almost a year, if not longer, without seeing our parents. Mm -hmm. And parents went lo a long time without seeing their kids or grandchildren. It's a lot. And so I think that many people had a lot of time to begin reflecting and writing during the pandemic. And I'm sure great writing has already come out, but I think the best writing is gonna come out in a year or two. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I was asking you whether your nemeses are more projection of internal flaws and insecurities rather than the reality of being an actual nemesis. Oh, no. <laughs> that's a good question and I mean maybe but like I, I, that may well be the case for some people because I think sometimes when we dislike people or when we're envious of people it is because of something internal and I wouldn't put it beyond the realm of possibility but in general like the nemeses that are like the serious ones no, it's just truly that they've wronged me <laughs> or, or I envy them. And right. I, I well, think you, that you, is. You, I feel like some of what you're expressing here is actually admiration. Uh, it's absolutely for, uh, admiration. Like my real nemeses are not scrubs. Like they, they're at the top of their game. And frankly, they should see it as a compliment because <laughs> um, they have 
hustled and worked really hard and no none of my nemeses have been like granted a good career every one of them has earned it and i would never take that from them yeah yeah uh amy wonders how long it took you to decide to write hunger uh you know grappling with uh, getting that vulnerable in in, in print mm -hmm. um i decided to write it i sold the book a few weeks before hunger i mean before uh bad feminist came out mm -hmm. and then i didn't actually write it until three years later so it took me three years and one year of delaying the release of the book to get it to start writing and get it out i actually ended up writing it in about four months but i had it took me three or four years of thinking about it mm -hmm. um, because i really was terrified about the vulnerabilities i thought that writing the book well would require and it was just an overwhelming prospect. And I think that my fears were valid because some of the reactions to the book really reinforced that it's really difficult to make yourself vulnerable where bodies and weight are concerned because people tend to be incredibly judgmental and incredibly unkind about bodies. But I have no regrets. And it actually helped me to face a lot of things in myself and to start to make some decisions for myself about making different choices. And um, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dina asks if you uh, are comfortable talking about your parents and how your relationship with them changed after hunger. Yeah. My parents are lovely. And um, I think that, well, one, I told them not to read Hunger. And for once, they actually listened to me and did not read it. And I'm so grateful. They know what's in the book. They came to the book launch. Um, I just didn't think they needed to read like the nitty gritty of it. But what it has done, I think it has deepened our relationship and it has given them clarity on things that confused them for many years. Um, and so that has been extraordinarily helpful. I think in terms of our relationship and we get along very well. I see them all the time. Now um, we bubbled with them for several months mm -hmm. so that we could see them. Uh, and actually they're coming back in two weeks. <laughs> so it's all very good. Yeah. Uh, talk about the sort of preparation for that though. How did you talk to them about mm -hmm. what you're doing uh, before you, before you did it? Yeah. Well, I wrote the book first <laughs> and so that I wouldn't compromise what I needed to put in the book because of fear of what they would think. But I did not tell them about Bad Feminist coming out. I told them I had a book coming out, but I didn't tell them about anything that was in the book. And so they ended up learning a lot of things that I should have probably told them about from Time Magazine. And so I knew I could not do that to them again. I'd never wanted to, you know, hurt them in any way. And so I actually sat them down and I said, here's what's in the book. And here's why I would prefer that you don't read it. And I would really like you to just respect this choice. And please know that there's nothing in this book that you need to be ashamed of. Um, and you can still go to church and hold your head high and hang out with your friends. And hearing that I think really helped them. And and also I brought them to the um, really, I had uh, several release events here in New York uh, where I am this week. Um, and so they were there and they saw and they listened to me read excerpts. So they didn't feel excluded and um, it helped. And we, you know, I also listened to their thoughts and it was good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there, there is, Something about uh, also the the sort of forced honesty that uh, that that is involved in that in that kind of situation where you're ready to talk about something that that you own uh, for, from your experience, mm -hmm. but that necessarily forces somebody else maybe to think about or come to reckon with something that uh, that they haven't done themselves or that they're worried about. Um, you know, somebody else knowing, right? Yeah. Uh, my friends don't know this. My family doesn't know this. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Naomi says, what tips and tricks help you when you find that you have writer's block? 
Yeah, I have dealt with it quite a lot in recent years, mostly because I haven't had time to just sit and think. And one of the key things that helps me is to just walk away. Like I, for me, staying at the keyboard and trying to force it never works. And so I will go read or watch a movie, go for a walk, hang out. I go to a bar with a friend pre-COVID, um, go to a museum. Art tends to trigger something a lot of the time, visual art. And so uh, things like that, sort of finding something creative that is not writing so that maybe some of the work I need to do to break through might happen in the back of my mind. Yeah. Uh, Kristen asks, what social media platforms do you find most useful for promoting your work? I'm guessing it's not Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Twitter, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think that Twitter, it can be a great tool, but you do not have to be on Twitter to sell books. I just have been on Twitter for quite a long time and I've developed a significant following on Twitter. And so it's useful in that regard. And it has been useful for many other writers as well. And I also use Instagram. Not I, I was late to Instagram. I think I've only used my, I've had an account for a long time, but I've only been using it for about four years. Mm -hmm. And I, I, it can be great. People tend to really love Instagram. And I think they love that it's just visual and curated and I think a little more low key. So I find both of those to be very good. I don't do Facebook. Um, my assistant runs my, I have two, two assistants that um, run my Facebook. Uh, I, I've also had a really hard time with Instagram. I, I feel like I don't understand it um, or just maybe <laughs> understand the distinction. Uh, between it and and Twitter, it seems like people are using Instagram the way they used to use Twitter. But then there's the image thing, which I, which also I think confounds me somehow. Yeah, Instagram is very image forward, and for me, as someone who hates having her picture taken, um, <laughs> I was very reluctant to get on board. And then I realized, oh, you can just put pictures of whatever up. And so I will put pictures of my cooking and baking and my um, books that I'm reading and mail that I get and art because I, I, I like art. And um, we just got a puppy uh, in um, October. Yeah. And so I will put pictures of the puppy up <laughs> and <laughs> he's super cute. So, you know. <laughs> Um, we have a question about the Monuments essay, when and where uh, that's going to be published. Uh, but that also leads me to my last question, which is, uh, what are you working on now? <laughs> yes. Um, the Monuments essay, I think, was published in the New York Times. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was published in the New York Times. And if not, it was published... Oh my God, I can't even, this is so terrible. Uh, but I can't remember. So like, can't where, even remember where your stuff gets published. I, you know, I used to keep track and it's so shockingly bad now, but I don't keep track anymore. Yeah. And um, I'm, that's bad because like my Vita is, um, oh yeah, okay. I remember where I published it. I published it of all things, we transfer has this great platform called We Present mm -hmm. and they published it. So it is online. Just Google um, my name and how to build a monument and you will find the essay. Yeah. And I am working on, um, I have a TV show that was just bought. Mm -hmm. And so that is moving forward from years of development. And I'm TV also writing, a, what was that? A TV show about what? Um, when I can talk about it, I will. But it's a I'm adapting someone else's material. Okay. Okay. And right. I'm also writing the screenplay for Hunger that will be coming to a television network near you, hopefully in 2022. And um, I'm working on some book projects. Yeah. Okay, uh, Roxane Gay. Again, it's always. Uh, Really great to talk with you. And I'm really glad that uh, we have you here with us in Detroit, at least virtually. Someday 
someday we'll get you to come visit us in person. I will. I love Detroit, and I can't wait to come back. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thanks very much for uh, for being with us. Awesome. Okay, I want to thank uh, Mary Grove, uh, of course, for uh, continuing this wonderful author series. Uh, this is the fourth year that I've been involved uh, with this, and each year it just uh, is incredible who we get to participate in the conversation that we have. Uh, of course, all of the sponsors and the community partners who, uh, who help make this uh, possible. Thanks to all of you in the audience for joining, and uh, we'll see you next year, hopefully in person, on the Marygrove campus for the next CALS lecture.